Good morning and welcome to Orlando Live Endoscopy webinar at the Center for Interventional Endoscopy at Advent Health Orlando. I know that this is very early morning for a lot of you and a difficult time globally where our education experiences are negatively impacted by the ongoing pandemic. Given the inability to meet at live conferences, this morning we wanted to share our experiences with you. We will be presenting a diagnostic dilemma which we encounter commonly in our clinical practice. Given an inability to meet at DDW in Chicago, we also plan to present the best 100 abstracts of DDW on May 8, 2020. The link for the registration will be available shortly. Please kindly forward this link to all our colleagues around the world. Our patient is a 74-year-old male with jaundice and a hyaline mass on CT scan. EOS guided fine needle biopsy was non-diagnostic on cell block. A 10 French plastic biliary stent was placed. We're performing an ERCP with single operator clangoscopy guided biopsy of the indeterminate biliary stricture so that a tissue diagnosis can be obtained so that we can uh, plan a uh, definitive management strategy, oncological management versus surgery. These are the learning objectives. We'll be discussing the role of single-use geodinoscopes in the practice of ERCP. Know the optimal number of single operator clangoscopy guided biliary biopsies that are required to establish a definitive diagnosis. Discuss the role of rapid on-site specimen evaluation in indeterminate biliary strictures. Know, know the role of SpyBike Max biopsy forceps in tissue acquisition. Know the role of artificial intelligence in reducing radiation exposure during fluoroscopy guided procedures. In the first clinical study of 60 patients undergoing ERCPs using the single-use geodinoscopes, two of the 60 patients required crossover to the reusable geodinoscope, and 58 patients completed their ERCP procedures successfully with the single-use scopes. Five adverse events were encountered, which included pancreatitis, bleeding, and worsening, worsening of the pre-existing infection. The spy bite forceps are utilized during single operator clangoscopy guided biopsies. The new spy bite max biopsy forceps have larger and serrated teeth and bigger fenestration holes on both jaws. The artificial intelligence integrated fluoroscopy system utilizes artificial intelligence technology integrated automated secondary collimation that blocks radiation to the area outside the region of interest for the majority of the image frame. So the secondary collimator reduces radiation exposure to the patient by further reducing radiation that passes through the aperture of the primary collimator. And the shutter's blades are controlled by an auto region of interest processor that includes AI technology. Before we go to the procedure, Again, a quick reminder to save the date as we'll be presenting the best 100 abstracts of DDW on May 8th from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The registration link will be available shortly. Please do kindly forward this link to all our colleagues around the world. We're now going to the procedure room with Dr. Varadara Julia. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I think we are all meeting in the, in the midst of difficult circumstances, but uh, it is such a pleasure uh, to always share our experiences with our colleagues from around the world. So we are going to demonstrate today by endoscopy, the evaluation of an indeterminate biliary stricture. But before I do so, we have in the procedure room this morning, uh, my colleague, Jiang Bang. Uh, Enrique is my uh, technician. Uh, Leanne is the nurse. Uh, Eddie is our um, uh, nurse anesthetist today. I've got Sam as my furrow technician. Conrad uh, is our cyto, uh, cytopathology technician. And we will start the procedure. So we thought we will uh, utilize uh, the single-use duodenoscope for this procedure because uh, we are trying to minimize uh, our uh, technicians from uh, handling uh, uh, infective endoscopes that has bodily secretions. And this is one opportunity to minimize infection risk, although this is not a COVID patient. So we will now um, have the single-use duodenoscope be removed from the package.
So this is a, this is a very sterile uh, equipment. It's very easy to handle. Uh, it's always left positioned straight uh, so that there is no, uh, uh, there is no kinks to the endoscope. Uh, it doesn't get bent. And then it's a plug and play system. So here is our processor. So Enrique is now giving me the shaft of the scope. You got to show so that they can see. And then he's just going to plug this in into the processor. And the processor is already switched on. And now he's going to switch on uh, the water, uh, the water. Uh, um, Oh, and case in the light of the camera. On the camera. Good. And then he has also uh, hooked a suction. Now what Enrique is going to do is he is going to put the caps to the system. It's very important to make sure that it is very tight and snug. The second is going to be the blue cap going into the water channel. That's done. And once that is done, we're going to now affix the suction cap, which should be put in, and then it should be turned around to be to be very tight. Once that is done, we are going to switch on. It takes about 20 seconds for the lights to come on. Entry. OK, good. So we are now going to start this procedure. No, 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 don't touch anything. Anthony, I need, oh, you, oh, for this one. Oh, yeah, sorry, XL on, sorry, one. And we're sharing. So now we are going to go and uh, demonstrate the endoscopy view. So let's have endoscopy on my screen. So this is a process of intubation. This is the same as what you will do with a conventional duodenoscope. If you have uh, any stiffness, you can always, this patient has, uh, is a little elderly, and uh, the echo, the duodenoscope is now passed through the oropharynx. He does have a small hiatal hernia, so now I'm in the stomach. I'm going to turn my uh, duodenoscope as I would with a regular scope. I'm advancing the scope towards the pylorus. And now I'm past the, past the pylorus through the second portion of the duodenum. Advance the scope as I would with a regular um, uh, uh, reusable scope. I'm locking and I'm shortening my duodenoscope. So this patient had a pre-existing stent that has been removed before the prior to this uh, procedure demonstration. And now uh, we will proceed uh, with just cannulating this patient at a prior sphincterotomy. So we are just going to use a standard balloon to, to cannulate and get a lay of the land to see how the stricture looks. How does it feel to pass the scope down the GI tract, Dr. V? The, the scope is pretty straightforward. I mean, one of the advantages of the uh, of the single-use scope is, is relatively a little bit more stiff than the regular scope. So your passage sometimes can be helpful uh, in patients with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a little bit of a hiatal hernia or a J-shaped stomach. It will not flex as much uh, in the stomach. It gives you some inherent stiffness. And we will talk through this process as we, as we go. So now uh, I have positioned my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my balloon right next to the major duodenal papilla. This has been, there has been a sphincterotomy performed before. I don't anticipate any difficulty with a cannulation. And I've advanced my balloon inside. So I want you to show you something today. I want you to focus on the, on the white square that you see on the screen. So this is exactly what Dr. Bang was trying to explain. So this is a unique technology. Uh, this is artificial intelligence integrated into the fluoroscopy machine. It's called FluoroShield, and this is manufactured by Omega Imaging, which is an Orlando-based company. So what this happens right now is in a conventional fluoroscopy, when we perform our procedures, you have uh, radiation or fluoroscopic exposure through the entire screen. But what AI or FluoroShield does is to focus radiation only within the square. So the machine is programmed in a way that it is going to track the place where the contrast injection happens, where the wire is going to be moving in, and whatever I will be doing is the only area where you will have radiation exposure. The surrounding areas around that white box will have no radiation exposure at all. But every 10 seconds, the, the X-ray machine will refresh the image around the square so that it remains fresh. 
and if the patient were to move a little bit the image captured on the screen will still will still say stay relevant so we have done studies that shows that using this technology uh, there is a decrease in radiation of 60% to everybody around the room and also the patient gets significantly less radiation particularly this is relevant uh, if a patient is pregnant or if there is any or if the patient is very young and if there is a concern of radiation exposure this is important and i think it is not uncommon to learn that we as endoscopists occasionally uh, do have uh, without a history of even smoking lung cancer and so forth which we ascribe to radiation uh, occupational uh, exposure so having this technology integrated what we found is that there is a significant advantages to the patients and to providers in the room because it decreases um, secondary exposure um, uh, to people in the room so now let's go to fluoroscopy and now enrique is advancing the guide wire past the biliary stricture and he's in the right system so once we are down we are going to inject some contrast let's inject contrast enrique we're going to pull down beautiful can we have the balloon up enrique a little bit Okay, that is my balloon of the liver hilum. We are trying to get a road map of how the stricture looks. I'm going to slowly pull back. So this patient had a prior ERCP, and you can see the stricture right there. It's somewhere at the proximal common bile duct. The bifurcation is spared, and I'm going to pull back now. Can we take an image? Yeah. Thank you. So our focus now is to go and biopsy that. So this patient previously had brushings and biopsies by conventional technique that was non-diagnostic and also by U.S. Garrett FNA. So now that we have a lay of the land, uh, we know what we are going to do. What I'm going to do is fluoro again, uh, make sure that the distal bile duct looks normal, inject some contrast, beautiful, and that looks good. Okay, Enrique, let's deflate the balloon. And before we proceed with single operator cholangioscopy, it's very important to clear the bile duct of contrast so that when we go inside, we will have good visualization. So we're going to wash and irrigate and remove all the contrast that we have in the bile duct. And we have a water pump that is available to do it. So let's have fluoro for one second, please. So I'm just going to wash it off. Any questions from our audience, uh, G? Um, just uh, one, just asking about if there was a need for white balance with the uh, disposable duodenoscopes. I mean, um, no, white balance, not actually. You can see the quality of the imaging. Um, at least when, uh, only when um, this question was asked, I realized that we are using the single-use scope. To me, it felt what it would normally feel with my imaging. Would you agree? I think the imaging quality is quite comparable uh, to what we have with regular scopes, particularly in this case, fluoro please. So what we are doing is just wash this contrast, and now uh, we are trying to wash the contrast in the in the left system, fluoro please. I'm going to let Enrique try to see if he can advance the wire. There you go, fantastic. And we're going to irrigate the system as well so that we can remove all the contrast uh, from the patient. Fluoro shot. Beautiful. We're going to still a little bit of irrigation and I think we're good to go. So now I'm going to, uh, re let's say, uh, remove everything in Rike. I, I would like to see if I can cannulate freehand using uh, spyglass. If this was a difficult cannulation, I will always leave behind a wire and then advance the uh, advance a spyglass um, over a guide wire. But I think I'm going to be uh, this is going to be a pretty straightforward. We should not have much problem uh, in cannulating the bile duct. So the uh, some more questions, Doctor uh, Doctor Varadarajulu. So um, they wanted to know which company made the duodenoscope. Okay. The disposable, the single-use duodenoscope. Okay. Uh, it's by it's made by Boston Scientific, 
Um, and what's the cost of the single use, do you need a scope, Dr. Varadarjulu? So, um, we have a very, very supportive hospital and a very supportive administration. Uh, this is the very, uh, one among the initial 100 cases we perform. So when we wanted to evaluate the scope, uh, we went to the Advent Health Cancer Institute and we told them uh, that we believe this is a significant development in endoscopy and we would like to do a randomized trial and we asked them for a grant. So they gave us a grant through which the scope was purchased. So I do not know the commercial value, but something in me tells me this will be quite similar uh, to, the, to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the price of a spyglass, possibly. Um, the spyglass we pay around the $2,500 to $3,000, and I would think uh, this, this would be the cost of the, of the single-use scope. So now everything is positioned. The spyglass has been uh, hooked on to the shaft of the single-use duodenoscope. I'm going to advance it gently out to make sure it's, it's exiting without a problem. How and that I can yeah. say it. How does that feel, Dr. Varadarjulu? It's, uh, I feel it a little stiff, but, uh, but it works very well. And the spyglass is, uh, uh, is, uh, is well visualized. So on my endoscopic view, I'm now going to push my scope a little bit uh, to go into the semi-long position to see if my cannulation will be easier. I'm now going to, I'm now going to elevate my, uh, the, the small knob on my spyglass to get a good angle. With now, I'm well positioned on the major duodenal papilla. I'm holding the shaft of my duodenoscope to advance it gently inside to see if I can go in without a problem. If not, I will require a guide wire. But I think I'm able to pass it. I do not have any resistance uh, to passage. I'm going to now shorten my scope a little bit. And I think I fell out. I'm going to repeat this exercise once more. <laughs> And um, uh, one of the uh, viewers asking about the processor, uh, yeah. whether it's the same processor as the spyglass. Oh, the so that's is, a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't think that has happened yet. I think that might be one of the developments uh, that will be very interesting to see if we can have two plug and play in the same processor. So we've got two different processors. We've got a processor for the disposable duodenoscope, and then we've got another processor uh, for the spyglass, but I'll be interested in a day where we can have two plugins where you can plug both the single use scope and the single operator cholangioscope into one system and make it a very compact, uh, compact um, uh, yeah, endoscope platform. So now uh, I'm going to go for fluoroscopy to see uh, my position. So let us look at it, fluoro place. So you can see that, that I'm still um, positioned somewhere below. I'm going to advance myself in. I have unlocked my cholangioscope so that I can get a good view. I'm going to advance even further. I think now I will be in the stricture zone or the region of interest. And I'm going to just irrigate. What I'm going to do is to just irrigate to see what I find on my spyglass. And so we need the spyglass on the larger image. Yeah, let's have spyglass on the larger image. Beautiful. And uh, what I'm going to do is to just irrigate. Spyglass All that I'm doing is washing. On the larger washing. image, Stephen, please. So I think... That is the tumor. Fluoro, please, for one second. Excellent. I can, I can go higher if I want to, because there was a 10 French stent in place. Image. But I think I'm able Fly to the see uh, the tumor pretty well. It's fairly vascular, as we can see, and it's fungating. So more than likely, this, is, this has to be a cholangio CA. We just need to get enough tissue from this. So this is a spy bite max. Can we open this Enrique? Let me see if I can leave it here. So you can see that the jaws of this, uh, if Stephen can focus the camera uh, behind in this back, black background, you can see that the jaws of this new spy bite max are a little is serrated. It's larger than what we used to have before. So the expectation is this will provide more tissue compared to the conventional techniques. So Stephen, can we zoom in on Dr. V's um... Spy bite max forceps. Open in Ricky. Yeah, there we go. With a camera. Over it could be camera. a little difficult to see because it's very, very small, but uh, staying just a feet away from it, I can see the serrated margin and then the wide margin. It's almost like a pediatric biopsy forceps. So let's close. So one of the challenges always 
uh, in, in single operator cholangioscopy is passage of these instruments through the single operator cholangioscope when it exits the duodenoscope. So you'll always find that these accessories get hung up on two locations. They get hung up as they exit the, the working channel. So I'm now advancing it gently. And the second time that we have a problem is at the tip of the uh, single operator cholangioscope. So at both locations, there is generally a problem in exiting. Right now, I have zero problems advancing it down gently. So I have a little resistance. So let me see what we are. Have fluoroscopy, please. So, I'm going to now straighten my, um, straighten the single operator scope. To facilitate this passage, so I'm going to retract this a little bit and see if this will make it easier. And or another option would be to just advance the single operator scope further into the patient to make passage easier. Sometimes on fluoroscopy, we can see um, where the challenge is. Fluoroscopy, please. So you can see that it is already down halfway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten it, shorten it, fluoro please again, and see if this will make it a little easier. Yeah, see that, how easy. This is one of the advantages of, um, uh, of the stiffness, I think, of the, of the single operator cholangioscope. The single operator cholangioscope stiffness actually makes passage of accessories much, much easier. Occasionally, you may have to retract the endoscope, duodenoscope, uh, into the bulb or into the second portion, and then exit the single operator cholangioscope with this accessory to make sure it's in good plane and then we can uh, cannulate the major papilla. But here, the inherent stiffness of the single operator scope makes the passage easier. So now, uh, with this uh, clearly in view, I'm going to advance it. So do we have spyglass on our uh, main screen? Yes, we do. Yeah. OK. We have it. So now I'm going to advance end. myself to the tumor. So I'm going to wash to get the best bites possible, going in even closer. And that is the tumor. And so, uh, what makes you think that's the uh, that's some more of a malignant um, structure than a benign structure? Ah, uh, Dr. so Barrow. one couple of things. One, we already know that from prior biopsies that this is a dysplastic lesion. Uh, so we already have some degree of history on this. The second is uh, when we the vascularity of this lesion. You can see that despite this being stented for a while, there are some nice frondy protections. And if I advance myself even a little further. I can see uh, that this is uh, yeah, infiltrative mass with, with vascularity around it. So to me, uh, this is more than likely uh, a malignant mass. This is not an inflammatory mass. So with this view, I'm going to still position myself better. I want to investigate this a little bit more. So there, is, uh, there are some stone debris, fluoro place. So I'm still in, um, below this lesion. I need to get closer. I'm going to wash a little bit more. Oops. Ah. OK. Can we close the spy bite? OK. So I fell back. I'm going to repeat this one more time. It's very difficult um, position. I mean, wise. this. Um... So one of the questions is whether we yeah. had a protocol uh -huh. concerning the number of biopsies to be performed during uh -huh. um, when using the uh, cholangioscope when using the cholangioscope for biopsies. Uh -huh. um, and the answer is yes, we have a protocol. We actually published a randomized trial on this, and the results we'll discuss in the summary. But we'll talk more about it when we're doing the biopsies also. Yeah. And then. Um, Another question was, do you hold the duodenoscope rather than the cholangioscope while using spyglass? Generally, we try to, you should just hold the, uh, hold the cholangioscope and not the, main, and not the duodenoscope. 
we haven't even started the biopsies, but once we do the biopsies, I think uh, that is where we need to be focusing on. And this patient, as I told you, has a little bit of a J-shaped stomach, yeah. making, um, uh, giving a little bit of a difficulty with, uh, with positioning. So once more, I'm now uh, trying to irrigate, wash, and, and look at this lesion better. But I also need to have a hand on the scope just because of the anatomy of this patient. He's an elderly patient. Yeah. And that is, my, uh, that is the lesion. So I'm going to get closer to it this time. I'm going to lock my small knob. And then I'm going to see if I can get this uh, duodenosco, uh, the, the spy bite closer to this lesion. Fluoro, please. I want to see where it exits. I'm still not through the channel. There you can see it, how nicely it comes out without any problem. So we have fluoroscopy on the screen, G. Yes, we have fluoroscopy on the uh, smaller image. Okay. Spy, uh, okay. The spy on the and there's a spy bite. So I'm going to wash it off a little bit because I have some debris. Open Enrique. So I'm going to grab that first prong. I'm going to push it inside. I'm going to apply suction. Close. And then I'm going to pull this tissue. So now let us see that quality of the tissue that comes out of this um, spy bite. So I want, uh, we are going to demonstrate a couple of things today. We want to show you how you can process your cholangioscope biopsy on site. So let's go to and Conrad. So, yeah, and Stephen, me. we would like uh, Conrad on the main image. Conrad on main image. We're getting that? Okay, excellent. Sure. All right, so um, we're going to open the biopsy forceps so that we can show you kind of the type of tissue we get. If we can just zoom on Conrad's hand. Let's zoom in Conrad's hand. So you can see the uh, piece of tissue that's attached to the end of the forceps. Uh, maybe you just angle it a different way, Conrad, so we can kind of see it separated out. Excellent. You can see this pinkish tissue right on the end of the tip. So first, we're going to perform a rapid on-site evaluation. So uh, the piece of tissue is gently picked off the forceps, uh, picked off the uh, biopsy forceps with those uh, little tongs. And it's gently placed on the slide. And then the specimen is gently rolled on the slide so that the surface cells adhere very gently to this slide. And then it's processed the same way as one would for an EOS guided final biopsy. So it's just gently rolled on the slide and the tissue is then placed in formalin so that can be um, evaluated at a later time. And I don't know if you can see the kind of the gentle sheen on the slide, which is basically the surface cells that have been adhered. And then we're gonna stain it in the usual way. Um, can you show Conrad's hand or maybe bring the um, over so we can show the staining process. Stephen, we need to show, we'll zoom out a little bit, please, so we can show Conrad's hands analyzing the specimen. Stephen, zoom out the camera. Zoom out. All right, excellent. There we go, excellent. All right. So while we're doing it, we can show. Shall we show the second bite, Doctor okay. Rajulu, while we're processing the specimen? Sure. Okay. So Stephen, we're now we're now going to go back to Doctor V. Uh, Enrique. So I'm positioned at the mask. Close for a second, Enrique, and you can see the tumor right there. So I'm going to advance my, uh, my cholangioscope. We're going to, Enrique is now going to open the cholangioscope, uh, the, the spy bite. I'm going to push against this mass. I'm going to apply suction. And then we're going to just take a good bite. Close. You can see the tissue. And then we're just going to pull it out. That's pretty much it. And so this, I think, is the reason for the malignancy, uh, Dr. Bang. You can see the, uh, 
the real vascularity of this lesion, particularly oh, when you biopsy it, and you can see yeah. the frondy mass. So unless proven otherwise, this has to be a, a cholangiocarcinoma. So generally, uh, we perform three biopsies. What we know from our work is that if you perform three biopsies, you get a diagnosis 90% of the time. But this is a challenging patient who has already had three endoscopies with an indeterminate stricture. So we might perform one or two more biopsies uh, before we stent. But we need to see what Conrad has on his pathology before we make that ultimate call. That's right. So some more questions. So um, uh, one of the questions that we're using, are we using SpyBite Max? And yes. that is correct. Yes, we're using the new SpyBite Spy Max, Max biopsy forceps. Um, does it feel, does the spy bite max feel more stiff than a, than a regular spy bite? Not actually. I mean, it, it is possible uh, that if I use a spy bite max in a, in a regular duodenoscope, a reusable duodenoscope, maybe there is some stiffness. But as you can see here, I've got no problems navigating uh, the spy bite max through the cholangioscope via this, uh, uh, with the more stiff um, uh, single use scope. It it's actually makes uh, single operator cholangioscopy biopsies or interventions much, much easier. I have no resistance uh, getting the accessory out each time. Uh, so this is a good example of the image quality uh, of the disposable uh, uh, endoscopes that we have. You have on your screen the, uh, the, the disposable image or a single use image. And then you also have the spy glass or the cholangioscope image. So they are pretty quite comparable. Uh, to commercially available reusable scopes. And so, Dr. V, we're going to show the um, rows being performed on okay. the second pass. The specimen so, looks really nice, the second pass. So, okay. Stephen, we're going to go back to Conrad on the overhead camera. Uh, zoom in, please. Can you see the little uh, the, the biopsy specimen on the slide? It gave a very nice bite uh, with the spy bite max biopsy forceps. So Conrad is again just going to gently roll it over onto the slide and then stain it and we'll have a look at the first uh, first bite under the microscope very shortly. I guess we're now going to go back to uh, Dr. V. Please, Stephen. So, gee, this is pretty efficient. So when you are talking, we already finished our third pass. Oh, excellent. So in clinical practice, <laughs> we usually perform only three, uh, three biopsies with a sensitivity of 90%. But that all depends on how the rose looks. So let us see how our, uh, uh, our on-site uh, evaluation of the specimen looks. If it looks very good, we might stop uh, after another pass. Uh, and if the quantity is suboptimal, uh, we'll perform more biopsies. If, um, if our biopsy is still suboptimal, then there's a possibly a need for performing uh, a dilation of the stricture to let us go more proximal uh, into the ductal system to perform more biopsies. But the fact that I can see a viable tumor here um, tells uh, something makes me feel that I don't have to perform a dilation. I should be able to get high quality tissue uh, just because uh, this looks uh, really vegetative and ulcerated. So once more, uh, here's my... Uh, and uh, one of the questions is whether we always use rows for these cases. Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, we are very blessed with a very uh, good cytopathology department, particularly a good uh, cytotechnician who is very, very good. So it's our natural preference that when, when we have access to Conrad, we do it. But as I have shown you, our study tells you that if you don't have a pathologist, if you perform three biopsies, your sensitivity will be more than 90%. But then it's very important about the quality of the biopsy that you obtain. I think it's uh, in 2020, it's important to use spy bite max because it's big. It's going to give you more tissue. And, uh, uh, and the technology has evolved uh, significantly open. Not everyone has a pathologist in the room. So you can see how big and wide jaw this forceps is. I'm going to push myself in. The technique is important. You push yourself. You push in. Uh, and then after you do that, you suck. You suck as much as you can. And then you, and then you, you advance your spy bite deep into the tumor, close. And you can see the pressure on the tissue. And then when you take it out, you get, you get good quality material. So if you're not, if you're just going to nibble away, then the quality of the specimen uh, may not be very good. And um, even though the spy bi max biopsy forceps are, do have bigger jaws, we would usually only do one bite per pass, correct, Dr. V? You would, correct. Or would you try and do multiple 
I mean, you can perform uh, because you've got serrated margins. It's very likely you can uh, you can take multiple tissue, but uh, uh, but generally the preference is to take one bite because you get good quality tissue. The second is we always irrigate constantly when we do our biopsies. So if you perform a biopsy and if you keep irrigating, and then if you miss the tissue from the biopsy forceps, it becomes a problem. So you can see that within a span of about seven or eight minutes, I was able to perform four biopsies. This is my fifth biopsy, and generally you don't have to do so many biopsies. One of the things that is very unique now that I've heard in the last few months is our oncologists are coming to us. Open. Open. Uh, okay. There it is. Close. Our oncologists are telling us that it's great that you're getting us good tissue uh, for, uh, for a diagnosis, but, um, but for cholangio CA, just as in pancreatic cancer, they are doing personalized treatment. So they are demanding more tissue to perform molecular profiling, profiling in cholangio CA. So that is something that we should take into consideration. So uh, I think even if you get a diagnosis on a one pass using rows, I think you should perform at least three biopsies or four biopsies so that after diagnosis, there is enough material for your oncologist to perform molecular profiling. So we've done five biopsies. Yes, uh, and G I think uh, the first pass is ready to be looked at on okay, the microscope. Okay, let's look at the first pass on the microscope. Yeah, microscope, please, um, Stephen. Excellent. Maybe we just need to be a little, yeah, focus. Excellent. So as you can see, you can see uh, um, dysmorphic cells with uh, irregular and enlarged nuclei, uh, which, is, um, uh, which means that we are definitely in the correct area when we're taking these biopsies. Um, so, um, to get the final diagnosis, obviously we'll have to wait for the pathology um, report um, for the specimens uh, placed in formalin, but it uh, definitely looks like we're in the right place. So, I think uh, this is one advantage of rows. Um, very often if the stricture is long, maybe we'll do another pass, very often if the stricture is long, uh, you don't know where to sample from. But if you've got rows, and if you're able to see under the microscope, yeah, I'm in the right place, then you don't have to worry about anything. All that you need to do is to get more tissue. So what I'm doing now is not for diagnosis. I'm quite confident from what Conrad has shown me uh, that we have got uh, high quality material um, in, the, uh, in the tissue. So, so all that I'm going to do now is to perform my, uh, if required, my, uh, even my last pass, and then we are going to go and deploy a stent. So I'm going to drive myself because we are right in the tumor mass. So our algorithm and clinical practices, everybody will get an EUS um, before, and then and then we proceed to spyglass only if you don't have a diagnosis open, and uh, that was the case in this particular patient. So once more, I've got that mass. I'm going to tighten it up, close Enrique, and then we're going to performing our last biopsy. That's it. So with this, uh, we will now uh, proceed to putting all these additional specimen uh, in, in what we call cell block so that it goes to the lab and then they will store it and leave it for the oncologist uh, to make a determination of whether molecular profiling is required. So I think we are done with spyglass. I'm now going to uh, Enrique. And uh, another question was whether um how the elevator feels on the single-use duodenoscope, Dr. V, um, and I, whether you can do therapeutic procedures, I think such this is, as uh, lithotripsy, laser lithotripsy. I mean, we are now performing a therapeutic procedure. I think if you are able to pass uh, a single operator cholangioscope through the working channel, you remember the working channel is, I think it's 4.2 millimeter. It is a larger than a conventional uh, duodenoscope. So, so if you can pass uh, uh, your cholangioscope, Every other accessory is relatively easy. So let us see how the elevator functions. So this is my range of motion. So do we have endoscopic views? Uh, yes, we have endoscopic So that is my yes, range of motion. Image. Um, Boston Scientific tells me that they are working on the elevator to make it a little serrated so that even you can lock the range of motion to make things easier. So if, sure this is the range of motion that I have. So you can quite do. We have done pancreatic interventions, including minor papilla interventions, um, and and it works quite well. But one of the now advantages. We need, uh, endoscopy. Sorry, Doctor V. One of the advantages it, it it locks very well. So if you are exchanging an accessory, it locks to the wire very very well. 
Yeah, Dr. Bang, you had a question? Oh, no, I just wanted the endos the flora image and the okay. endoscopy image. Yeah, both coming up. Okay. Fluoro, please. And once again, you can see how beautifully the box follows. You can look at the amount of radiation exposure uh, that, uh, that is significantly decreased using this fluoro shield technology. This is important. I think uh, very often while we care for our patients, we don't uh, care for ourselves. Uh, and this technology really, really makes uh, decreases exposure to almost negligible limits. So now you can see me exchanging. Absolutely no problem. Uh, the guide wire is not moving. So my preference is uh, to put on a 10 French, 12 centimeter plastic stent in this patient. This could be resectable uh, given the uh, anatomy of the tumor. Um, I don't uh, think um, this is going to be a palliative procedure. I think it is possible. Uh, that because the tumor is confined and on CAT scan, we are seeing no nodes and so forth, this patient may go for a primary uh, resection. So we are just going to go and deploy a plastic stent. Otherwise, we can uh, uh, seriously consider the placement of an, uh, uh, an uncovered metal stent in this patient. And um, there was a, some uh, viewers wondering whether uh, you regularly do an EOS FNA for hyalur masses and whether there is any concern for seeding and possible surgery. Can so see? that's a good question. We do perform FNAs uh, on hyalur masses, but only when the patient is not a surgical candidate. So if you've got a very elderly patient with a lot of comorbidity and, and we know that uh, surgery is not a consideration, then, then, then the risk of seeding is actually overestimated. Um, so we don't have a problem. But if it's going to be a young patient, or if there's a possibility of the patient being a surgical candidate, then we never perform uh, a, a transduodenal or a transgastric fine needle aspiration biopsy. We prefer to use a single operator colonoscopy um, um, uh, because it's very useful. In this particular case, it was uh, the mass was below the liver hilum, so we felt confident that it should not be a problem. So this patient had a EUS before. Uh, fluoro, please. So now we are going to deploy our plastic stent. Uh, pull me in, pull me in. What size the stent? Up? So this is a 10 French stent. So since someone was asking, uh, how is it to pass uh, accessories and perform interventions? It is quite pretty straightforward. And you can see the image quality is fairly good. Uh, there is no resistance or difficulty to passage of accessories. And um, yeah, when how would you decide whether to play single versus um, bilateral stenting in this particular patient? Well, in this particular case, the decision is very straightforward uh, because um, because this is not a disease that involves uh, either of the right or the left system. It's all confined to the proximal common bile duct, and you can have very very good imaging here to prove that. So that is the reason that I'm just placing a single stent. And we know that this patient, when, she, uh, when he came today for his procedure, uh, did not have any problem um, and was not jaundiced. He came only for tissue diagnosis. So this stent should work. I don't think we need to perform our bilateral stenting. So let's remove the guide wire. And uh, another question is about the, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, incorporated flora system, whether it could be incorporated in all existing flora systems or just to this particular? So case. that is a uh, yeah, yeah, good question. I do not know about a patent uh, and other things, but as you know, uh, this uh, imaging system, when we set up this unit, uh, we went for Omega because it was uh, reasonably priced compared to conventional systems in the market. And, and they were also more innovative. Uh, I think uh, this fluoro shield is very unique only to the system. And the company is also working on 3D mapping. So if you have got images on a 3D, uh, on, a, on a Hylar Colangio and so on, they are trying to see if they can program something and integrate it per case basis in the fluoroscopy machine so that it will provide us a detailed anatomy of the liver hilum and so forth. But to my knowledge, uh, this AA system now exists only in one technology, which is Omega Imaging. So this procedure is now complete. I'm going to now uh, deflate air, uh, remove the scope, and uh, we are going to have a nice session recap to just quickly uh, summarize uh, the literature. But more importantly, I think before we uh, go, I want to thank my team members who have uh, uh, 
uh, who have supported this uh, program and my hospital uh, who want educational activities to go on the unhindered no matter what the situation is on the outside but it's such a pleasure uh, to be here for me and dr bang and and all the staff of my endoscopy unit uh, to share our uh, simple experience with this procedure with you this morning uh, are there any other words uh, that you want to add dr bang no just thank you for joining us this morning and uh, please make sure that you register for the ddw abstract update what we did is we did not have ddw this year but we are going to review all the abstracts that were submitted to the meeting so we thought we will present 100 of the abstracts on may 8th so please let your colleagues know we'll review some abstracts perform some quick procedures in between it'll be an hour and a half to two hour program uh, but do email us and and keep in touch with us and more importantly please be safe and please take care of yourself and from all of us in orlando thank you so much and we can go to the session recap thank you Now for the session recap, single use duodenoscopes may have a role in immunosuppressed patients with obstructive jaundice, high risk patients with suspected multidrug resistant organisms, and perhaps in pandemics to minimize exposure to bodily fluids. In order to optimize the outcomes of single operator clandoscopy guided biopsies, in centers with on site cytopathology support, Diagnosis can be established with a median of one biopsy with diagnostic accuracy of 87.5% and therefore may be particularly useful if prior biopsies are indeterminate, biliary structure is complex and the diagnosis is time sensitive. In centres without on-site cytopathology support, diagnostic accuracy of 90% can be achieved by performing three biopsies. The outcomes data on the spy bite max biopsy forceps are limited, but preliminary experience appears to be promising. Comparative studies are required with existing methods to establish superiority. In a prospective study of 100 patients undergoing fluoroguided endoscopic procedures, the use of AI incorporated fluoro systems have shown to decrease radiation, radiation exposure to both patients and medical personnel. Um, again, a quick reminder that we plan to present the best 100 abstracts of DDW on May 8th from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link for registration will be available shortly. Please kindly forward this link to all our colleagues around the world. Again, Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Goodbye.